Hello and welcome to North 100, a Canadian Highlander podcast. I'm Serge. Joining me today, I have a Jer. Hello. And a Wheeler. Ahoy. A reminder that North 100 is brought to you by you with your support over at the Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. Welcome to part three of our call time set review. Today, we're going to be covering green, gold, and colorless. A reminder that our set reviews are not exhaustive. We do not talk about every single card, only the cards that we think are relevant to our format, and we analyze all of the cards from a Canadian Highlander point of view. Let's jump into it with green cards, and starting off, we have Battle Mammoth. Battle Mammoth is a 5-mana 6-5 with Trample for 3 green green. It's an elephant, and says, Whenever a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, you may draw a card... And foretells for two green, green. Jer, start us off. What do you think? Thank God this can be countered. (laughs) Yeah, this card has a lot of good text. It's big, and it has the best big creature keyword, which is trample. The static ability is insane, and you can basically only get around it with like wraths or basically just wraths. At that spec, the question though is the new best big creature keyword can't be countered now? No. No, it's it's trample. It's still trample. All right, I yeah. just wanted to check in. That's like mostly the decider for a lot of big green idiots is like trample or haste in rare occasions where it's because yeah. it's just like you could have like a three mana like six six or whatever. If it doesn't have trample, cool. It's just gonna get blocked by a bunch of one ones forever. Yeah, yeah. Like, what would you rather your existence to be? Like get countered. It's a one for one, or just like forever blocked by one ones it's just like it's so much bigger so much more threatening but you just you just get get goozled by a pack of one ones at least rotting regisaur has an upside attached to it too yeah <laughs> all right let's move on to the blizzard brawl one mana single green pip snow sorcery choose target creature you control and target creature you don't control if you control three or more snow permanents the creature you control gets plus one plus O oh and gains indestructible intent until end of turn then those creatures fight each other wheeler so cards that just like take prey upon so one mana fight a thing with upside they're pretty darn good in like a mono green deck or in in some cases even like a green black deck. And this one is probably just sticking to mono green if you're playing it. But this one is better than Savage Swipe, which is one it's that that's a, a fight card for Modern Horizons that if you're targeting a 2-2. It's a bear punch, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, that's Savage Punch. Oh. Oh, it, that's literally punching a bear savage swipe is it's a punch but better if you are a bear oh. <laughs> but like it's th- th- between this card and primal might you just have two one mana fight cards primal might's so good <laughs> yeah that card's just absurd that card it turns out that card is like a fight card and then also fireball it's like fight card berserk split <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty pretty not bad. And uh, like, if if you need to cast Blizzard Brawl before you have you know the sufficient snow permanence, and usually it's just snow lands, that's fine because you're probably just chomping on like a mana dork or like a Mother of Ruins before it's able to at- uh, do a thing, or just Fauna Shaman. Love killing me a Fauna Shaman. So if you don't have the snow requirement, not a huge deal. Even later, like your things are probably bigger than their. Th- things that's why you're playing this kind of card in the first place but also just indestructible is kind of messed up like this can be like i'll kill your thing and then also just get to attack with impunity and that's an effect that typically costs four mana (laughs) like we have seen that at four mana and three mana or two mana like there's a lot of white give a thing indestructible for two mana right yeah i I just mean the combination of indestructible plus fighting like that is Yeah, yeah that that part's messed up yeah, that's that's a thing. And but yeah, this I, I really like this card. I, I, I think it's one of the ones you're going to want to play if you want to fight card. Cool. Next up, we have a card from the Commander Precons. Is that the way to describe this? Yes. Kaldheim Commander. 
I don't know if it, I don't know if there's like additional product or if this is specifically a card from a pre-constructed deck. We're talking about Bounty of Skemfar, but go ahead, Wheeler. All uh, right, yeah, they're just uh, with basically every release will now have two commander decks that are associated with the set itself. So there are two commander pre-constructed decks with brand new cards that is attached to Kaldheim thematically. Cool. Bounty of Skemfar is a three mana sorcery for two and a green. Reveal the top six cards of your library. You may put a land card from among them onto the battlefield tapped and an elf card from among them into your hand. Put the rest onto the bottom of your library in a random order. Wheeler, what do you think? The more I, I kind of went on a roller coaster ride with this card. Like it is a three mana card that in the right deck elves, you are pretty likely to be able to have it just read, put a land into play and draw an elf. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. But do elf decks want this? Like, would I rather just play something like lead the stampede if I really want like a non creature like card advantage kind of card? And so I was kind of down on it. But after talking it over with a couple of people that are invested in the uh, well-being of elves in the Canlander, they uh, they and they've kind of convinced me. I think it it's it has room to see some play just because it can hit any land and the fact that it doesn't put the elf directly into play can be shockingly beneficial. Like, it sounds like it'd be a downside, but you're already a deck that's going super wide. You never want to overextend. And you're a deck that has a bunch of cards that trigger on casting creatures. Yeah, your glimpse effects, right? So Yeah, exactly. So I, 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 I like it more than I thought I would, but I this is also just kind of like in that category of I'm not I wouldn't be shocked if I saw someone play it against me, but I wouldn't actively look to slam dunk it in every elf deck I play. Or hoof deck, I guess. Next up we have Boreal Outrider, three mana three two snow elf warrior for two and a green. Whenever you cast a creature spell, if snow of any of that spell's colors was spent to cast it, that creature enters the battlefield with an additional plus one, plus one counter. So to be clear, you have to use snow for the colored pip, I think is the easiest way to describe that in normal terms. Wheeler, what do you think? And also, Jer, I'm looking at the list and noticing that we haven't assigned a lot to you. Feel free to hop in whenever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a there's a lot of elves in a row here, and I'm, uh, I'm all ears, uh, pointy ears. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I should a, laugh and reward a, that joke. That's just an elf joke we have. I mean, this card might also just be like a green white card, potentially, or a warrior's card. Like this card dies to shock. Certainly, that's not great. But that's the only bad thing of the, about this card, I think. It, just because like, <laughs> like this ability that the ability that it has is like deceptively strong. Yeah, right? yeah. You read it a couple of times and it doesn't seem that good until you realize it's not an additional cost. It's if you're just careful how you cast your spells or if all of your lands are snow permanents, it just reads all of your creatures enter the battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on them, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and its mana cost is flexible enough so that if, say, you are like a two color or a three color counters deck and you need to, you know, fetch, say, let's say your Abzan, you fetch like a green white duel because this has such a low color requirement. You are you put yourself in a position where you can maybe just fetch up like a snow basic of like your third color. And as long as you have the appropriate creatures to follow up after this card, they're going to get the bonuses without much of the downside of potentially uh, mucking your mana base. Next up, we have, oh, we have the Canopy Tactician. Four mana, three, three elf warrior for three and a green. As the static ability, other elves you control get plus one, plus one. And taps to add green, green, green. Wheeler, it's another elf. It's an, it's an elf that adds three. I wouldn't play it in non-elf decks that play elves, but I played <laughs> in elf decks. My issue with this card is it's a warrior and not a druid. <laughs> oh, no, my oh, God. Oh, no. I was going to say, speaking of non-elf decks that are elf decks, hey, Jer, would you play this in druids? No. Okay. Why is it a warrior? It adds three mana. Like, I get it's yeah. a lord, but warriors don't add three mana. I don't understand why with the party mechanic from Zendikar that they have to, like, isn't a druid a part of D&D &D parties? Where's multi-class? <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> Truly, you had to have taken at least one level in Druid to make three mana. Yeah. I don't know what the, that means, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, Druid. Just make all elves Druids. How yeah. relevant is the ability to tap for mana here, though? It's so oh. weird that a four mana elf is also a ramp spell. Do you know how much Craterhoof Behemoth costs? <laughs> Do you notice that you can go, like, curve this directly into Craterhoof Behemoth? I hadn't thought of that but that, one, that interesting. one's pretty good yeah three mana is a lot of mana like there were previous versions of hoof that ran um, like somberwald sage which is a three mana zero three mana zero one that only adds three mana for uh creature spells and like lanoir tribe when it showed up that card felt fake yeah do you know what's a druid somberwald sage adds three <laughs> mana point one for somberwald sage <laughs> but like that deck likes having a lot of mana it adding three mana and you know throwing a query and ranger it adds six mana the three modes for the the elf deck slash hoof deck slash like big green creature decks are you either want to cast a lot of really small spells which adding three mana helps you want to cast really big spells which adding three mana casts or you want to cast a combination of really a lot of really small <laughs> spells and a really big spell which three mana really helps and and then your backup is like, oh, well, I don't need to add any more mana. I guess I have to resort to attacking with my one ones. But now they're two twos. I suppose my question comes from there's often an important point in terms of mana cost where you want your ramp spells to be. And that's normally like one, two or three mana. It just seems odd that your four drop would also be a ramp spell. Well, it's because it also fits into the game plan of like making your creatures harder to remove like getting all your creatures out of forked bolt range is is more important than you you'd you'd think mm -hmm. and also just like cr then creating a threat like all of a sudden you play this your other mana dorks can threaten planeswalkers you can start pressuring a combo dex life total while also threatening big spells as long as you have cards in hand so your opponent still has to play differently this card is very unique in that it's hit that sweet spot of offering both lord and ramp spell it it's not the worst of both. This is actually kind of the opposite. It's hit that good point of ramp and lord. Yeah, it's just like an always guaranteed elvish arc druid sort of thing. Like it's like an elvish that also just attacks well by itself. It sort of does what Xenagos does in that it, it like plays to the board and threatens big things from your hand but it's not a planeswalker so it's easier to find cool honestly i was very medium looking at this card also easier to remove but yeah yeah like if you ever untap with this card your your chances of winning surely just like went went way up Th this card genuinely feels fake like lanoir tribe feels <laughs> fake in the sense of like they wouldn't print that this one just has so like it's just so clean right the templating is like elf big me mana and it's like okay you know like i'm fairly certain i made this card on like crayons and like paper it's like wheeler described the perfect elf okay it's four mana three three it's a lord and it gives you mana You're like no okay well <laughs> i mean yeah that like 10 year old wheeler would say that <laughs> <laughs> Lanoir tribe, also a druid. Sorry, uh, Adult yeah. Wheeler would say, Mimi like elf, elf cast four mana. So <laughs> no, uh, yeah, Adult Me is like, how easy can I kill my own elf? And then the elf <laughs> just like starts sweating. It's like, uh, <laughs> what do you mean? All right, we've talked about Canopy Tactician. We can move on. Next up, surprise, surprise, another elf, Elvish Warmaster is a two mana two, two elf warrior for one and a green. Whenever one or more elves enter the battlefield under your control, create a 1-1 one, one green elf warrior creature token. This ability triggers only once each turn. It's an important line of text. And then activated ability for five green green elves you control. Get plus two plus two and gain death touch until end of turn. Wheeler, start us off. All right. Now, first, I want to say it's not my fault they put all these damn cards at the beginning of the alphabet. And secondly, this card is like an absolute slam dunk for me. Wirewood Hive Master is like one of my favorite elves of all time and favorite cards of all time, which we've received a bit of an upgrade 20 years down the line. The fact that this triggers off of token elf creatures as well, like granted only once per turn, but you can really get things popping and it only costs two. Like you get to play this. If you go mana dork on turn one, untap, and then you play this and then another mana dork or like a Quirion Ranger or something, <laughs> like you now have four bodies on the board and God knows how much mana. 
That's very scary. Yes. Also, that ability is pretty gross. It it costs a lot, but it's it. I mean, death touch, pretty gross. This card is also really good with uh, Nettle Sentinel and Birchlore Rangers. Oh yeah, so that's oh, oh. that's the thing you're interested in doing. Let's talk about our first god of the day, Essica, God of the Tree. It's a double faced modal card. The front face is a one four for three for one green green, has vigilance, taps to add one mana of any color, and says other legendary creatures you control have vigilance and tap to add one mana of any color. And on the other side, we have a Wooburg enchantment called the Prismatic Bridge and raids at the beginning of your upkeep, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or planeswalker card, put that card onto the battlefield, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Jer, why don't you start us off? I don't really know how to feel about this card. Like, it it does things that I like, but I think deep down, I just think they're not quite good enough. Like, there isn't... I just don't know where I'd play this card. Like, the backside is, is like, yeah, it's like... It's cool, but it, like you can't plan to to do that. Like it can be a thing that can happen in your deck, but I don't think you can play this card to plan for the backside. So you're playing it for the front side, and I just don't know any decks that that want that. What about Super Friends? Like a free Planeswalker every turn in Super Friends seems kind of cool. Yeah. Oh, you you mean like playing out the Prismatic Bridge? Yeah. I th- the mana is not good enough in Super Friends. I and and like the big thing with Planeswalker decks, anytime there are cards like this or like to deploy the Gate Watch or like any kind of like big thing that lets you cheat out Planeswalkers or makes them better or something, is that you're always just better off playing just another Planeswalker. Unless it's Eureka, I'll die on this <laughs> That's right, a different. Yeah. That's a different story. <laughs> But like, yeah, just play another Planeswalker or another Time Warp, and uh, that'll probably do you better than taking a turn off to potentially do something. Yeah, I agree. All right. Like, do, do you see anywhere that the front card is, the front half of this card is, mm. like, actively good? The Command Zone. Yeah, like, that's <laughs> that's what I was getting at. Like, you could, like, meme and play, like, five color legendaries, which I've, like, sort of done, but... It's like not a real deck. I'm at the point where I'm like one of the first cards I want to really sleeve up in paper again is Mox Amber. Like I'm like, we're at the density for this, but I don't think that this card is one that would show up in a deck where I would be playing Mox Amber, you know? Yeah. So So just to facilitate a conversation pretty quickly, I have seen this card seen some play in Cascade-like decks, specifically in standard Tybalt Trickery. And I know we normally talk about Canadian Highlander, but as a hit for something, because when you trickery into it, you can play the backside Mm -hmm. as a way to do other stuff. In Highlander, if you're looking to cheat things out, there's like... The prismatic bridge doesn't make the top 100. <laughs> Tinker. I, I If I want to cheat, I'll play Tinker or Underworld Breach or something like that. Or Sneak Attack. Like, Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> sneak Attack and Academy Rector. Now we're talking. That's how you get your prismatic bridge, also known as Omniscience. Well, let's move on then. Next up, we have In Search of Greatness, which is a two-mana enchantment for Green Green and says, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a permanent spell from your hand with converted mana cost equal to one plus the highest converted mana cost amongst other permanents you control without paying its mana cost. If you don't, just scry one. What do we think of this? Hand pod? What do we call this? Uh, Oh, hand pod. I thought you said (laughs) ham pod. This is closer... uh, Oh, God. If I say this, somebody's going to be like, well, Ben called it Aether Vial, so I think it's good. Which, (laughs) But it's more analogous to Aether Vial in the sense of like... You start yeah. creeping up, but it's it's not like you you lose all the utility and the nicheness of that card, as well as you know you don't either value. You don't have to rely on having other things in play. I think the only deck I actively want to play this in is a Lurin, but I, I I like it in Enchantress just because like you know it's an enchantment, but that's but that's really it. That's not where my mind goes, but yeah, I could definitely see it in that deck. Yeah. It's yeah. It again, much like the the conversation about the the like super friends cards. These look exciting because they have such a high, you know, like oh, what if I get to untap and I sneak in my Oko or Jace the Mind Sculptor or 
God, that's a dated card to mention. Uh, it's solid though. Yeah, it it you know, there's always the best case scenario, and like especially when cards like this get made nowadays, they often have some kind of mechanic attached to it, so it doesn't feel that all in. But realistically, if you're playing this card in a deck with sufficient permanence to take advantage of, you know, the first ability reliably, when that doesn't happen, how comfortable are you playing this as a two mana permanent that lets you scroll? Try one for the next two upkeeps, and then you probably die. Now that you're making me think about it, though, I do think I like this in Enchantress. Oh, yeah. Draws a card. Well, specifically because it's cast. So Aether Vial, uh, which was the comparison we had earlier, is good because of the instant speed. You know, you do it on your opponent's turn, and it specifically doesn't cast, so it gets around counter spells. This has a very significant downside, which is you're not playing it, you're playing it for free, air quotes, but you're still using the stack in a way that's a lot more intractable than the way Aether Vial, because Aether Vial, they don't have any information, right? You activate mm -hmm. it. They can stifle blind, but, you know, you kind of roll the wheel. You, you roll the dice, and you're like, what creature is coming out? You get full information when, when you're casting something off of In Search of Greatness. But that's fine, because in Enchantress, you draw off the cast trigger. So you're mm -hmm. still getting the value. I like this a lot in Enchantress. Yeah. You're also playing, like, all these wild growths, right? Yeah, the, the card's inherently card negative, so I think it makes sense to play it in decks that have high velocity, like like Enchantress, like like Aluren, that also have, like, a good ability to control, like, the number on, on like, mana cost and permanence they have in play, so it's, like, relatively easy to manipulate. But, like, mo yeah. most decks, this is a, a worse, more overcosted Miri's Guile. Yeah. <laughs> we, we all know how I feel about that. Oh, that's hilarious. All right, let's move on and talk about the greatest spread in all of Magic the Gathering. That's right, it's Yorn, God of Winter. Look at that art. Oh, I don't uh, know. No, I've been looking at this stupid art since it came out. Ah, uh, God. Just like, hey. Why are you, who's, nobody sits like that, except in scenarios that I do, I don't want to say. I don't want to say. Anyways, if you're not familiar, Yorn God of Winter is a three mana, three, three for two and a green legendary snow creature god and says whenever Yorn attacks, untap each snow permanent you control. Did you know this card also has a backside? Let's flip it over. Oh, I'm... Uh... On the other side, we have Kaldring the Rhyme Staff is a three mana legendary snow artifact for one, a blue and a black. Tap, you may play target snow permanent card from your graveyard this turn. If you do, it enters the battlefield tapped. So this is obviously a very powerful snow synergy card. And we've been talking about snow throughout our entire set review and how we're probably getting a little bit closer to there being not necessarily like an all in snow deck, but snow matters does yorn have a home in our format mono green aggro why is he sitting like that mono green aggro just to give vigilance or to to like untap your lands so you can keep the velocity going untaps all your lands so it lets you apply a lot more pressure like on turn four you get to play a four drop pre-combat then attack then have four mana to do stuff in combat so it makes it very hard for them to block then assuming they don't block because all your creatures are better than theirs you get to play another thing post combat mm -hmm. or keep up mana for like something blossoming defense yep the other blossoming defense the third blossoming defense there's also just more haste creatures in green too. Like again, like we, it, it feels weird to say, but like it's not just Questing Beast and Vengevine, although it's mostly Questing Beast and Vengevine. <laughs> How dare you omit Groundbreaker. Oh God, I have played <laughs> more, too much of that card. But now I'm thinking of every bad Groundbreaker deck I've ever played. It's, I put that card in a deck with Kodama's Reach, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah oh look it was 2009 it was it was a different time yeah it's like if you have a bunch of snow covered forests which you absolutely can this card's great there's also some uh, very i don't want to i mean it's probably niche but it's popped up it's popped up enough and it, the, every time somebody talks about adding more cards to it it sounds better is the the flip side of this jerk i wanted to talk about that yeah yeah, so retreat to or not retreat to Coral Helm. What is it? There's some combo that involves sacking snow lands and or playing things. And you get to do stuff that doesn't always use fast bond. This is a really succinct description I'm giving. But uh, what I'm trying to say is it's in the right colors 
to do this kind of thing, as well as like it just provides additional flexibility that you might find yourself actually like that backside might be relevant. Suddenly is like bad crucible of worlds, isn't it? Yeah. Awful crucible. <laughs> yeah, because it doesn't hit strip mine or wasteland. Like minus all the combo potential. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of like what the combo application with that is, Wheeler. Like 95. Do you do you need uh retreat? and the the amulet i i I think it involves retreat retreat to coral home only untaps all right let's bring up retreat to coral home really quickly here retreat to coral helm is a three man enchantment for two and a blue whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control choose one tap or untap target creature and scry one okay maybe i've been lied to maybe somebody coerced (laughs) me with the idea of an infinite loop using a (laughs) bad three mana artifact it's got to be doable like then there's a creature that taps or untaps something yeah yeah the creature untaps the artifact and then you sack the yeah. land and <laughs> oh god it all the pieces were like these are real cards and they could theoretically be in the uh-huh. same deck and it's not shocking but that could also just be me hungry for any degenerate awful combo tech that someone's willing to pitch at least the art on the backside isn't terrible, though. Oh, maybe it's Rhyme Tender? There's like a two-mana elf that untaps a snow permanent that y- uh-huh. you can tap it to untap a snow permanent, and that's oh, a snow sure. permanent, and you Coral Helm or something. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, there's uh-huh. there's another yeah. There's another elf that does that, <laughs> too, in this set. I mean, you could just play like Keyword as Follower that untaps anything. Oh, yeah. Direct all complaints to at Serge Jaeger. Wait, hold on. No. Hold on. Time out. Time out. Time out. I did not sell you on this this is like that time i discovered pillapala and i was like this card is sweet you're like serge we're not playing 2007 magic anymore move on what when would i I, hey i love grand architect (laughs) next up we're gonna talk about kolvori god of kinship this is a four mana two four for two green green legendary creature type god as long as you control three or more legendary creatures, it gets plus four, plus two, and has vigilance. Activated ability, one and a green, and tap. Look at the top six cards of your library. You may reveal a legendary creature card from among them and put them into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. On the other side, we have the Ring Heart Crest, two mana legendary artifact for one and a green. As it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Tap to add a green. Spend this mana only to cast a creature spell of the chosen chosen type or a legendary creature spell wheeler what do you think serge i'm regretting making you say all that because i don't think this card's very good now that i'm reading it that was so much to read (laughs) well i mean you're probably going to get to attack for six once but even then like the fact that you need three like it, it counts itself as a legendary creature which is nice but typically if you have a board with three creatures in play and all three of them happen to be legendary you're already in a great spot. You don't exactly need to be playing out additional things or, uh, and even, you know, using those things to dig for more creatures, more legendary creatures and board pressure. Kind of relevant to the Mox Amber conversation or the Mox Amber talking point. Like I do think there's a, a density there's enough legendary creatures where you could make a deck with a very strong legends theme and it wouldn't be doing something just for the sake of doing something. But even in that, like, is this really making, I I don't think this is going to make the grade for there. Like it just, I don't know. It doesn't die to bolt. It's, it's mana cost is, is easy. This feels like the kind of card where now that I've said all this, I'm going to die to this. Like someone's going to kill me with this card. <laughs> I agree with you on every point except the last one. I, I refuse to die to this card. It's it's just yeah. not good enough. It's weird. Nobody's going to run it out early and you're not going to be threatened, right? Like this comes down on turn three. You're like, oh, you mean you spent your ancient tomb and your elf to cast Kalvari and now I'm facing down a 2-4? And I guess I'll wait three more turns for you to establish your board to turn it into a 6-6 six, six with Vigilance, but I think I'll just kill you in the meantime. Or you just kill one of their legend, other legendary creatures that are actually threatening, and now this is a 2-4 without Vigilance again. Oh, okay, in my defense, Jeremy's meme cards are five-mana mythic creatures. <laughs> Serge's meme cards are enchantments that say creatures don't exist, and mine are like soul wardens <laughs> with downsides. This is so if I think I'm gonna die to this card, it's probably because somehow I figured out a way to play a worse card than this, which at least this has a you know, this at least has 2021 design behind it. I'll have you know my my meme cards are six mana vanilla creatures with cycling. Oh, he's got you there. Mm. 
<laughs> Let's talk about uh, Masked Vandal. Two mana, one, three, shapeshifter for one and a green. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile a creature card from your graveyard. If you do, exile target artifact or enchantment an opponent controls. Jer, what do you think? This card is really, really good. <laughs> Exiling a creature card from your graveyard isn't a huge cost. It'll be, it's a, it's a downside. Like it's not as reliable as Knight of Autumn or, or Rex Age, but exiling the opponent's artifact or enchantment is a much, much bigger deal than just simply destroying it. So I, I think this card's really good. Going to see a bunch of play. It's two mana, so it's easier to cast. Since it's a utility type creature, the one three body is way better than a two one since it blocks a lot better. Comes down earlier. It's serviceable against red decks because it blocks literally all of their one drops favorably. Yeah, this this card's really good. And cool. it's an elf and a druid. Yeah, it has all the relevant creature types. And the non-relevant creature types. All right, let's move on to Old Growth Troll. Three mana four four troll warrior for green, green, green. It's been a while since we've seen the triple pips. Has trample, and when it dies, if it was a creature, return to the battlefield it's an aura enchantment with enchant forest you control enchanted forest has tap to add green green and one tap and sack this land to create a tapped four four green troll warrior creature token with trample it's recursive jer what do you think this card's really good yep it's it's gonna come up and smack your opponent around a bunch then it's gonna come back onto the battlefield and ramp out your threats and then when you've run out of cards it's gonna be a four four a trample again and smack your opponent again yep i think this is a new staple in like green based aggro decks mostly mono green like maybe if you're like heavy green splash of color aggro maybe in like green black where your black cards are like abrupt decay and assassin's trophy but yeah if, if you can reliably cast it this card's gonna be good in your deck so absurd yeah <laughs> yeah Oh my god! Why does it have trample? Because uh, it's there's good. a lot. Every everything like everything is just just pinched up just a bit. Like the fact that this is just a it's it's just a, it, when it dies it becomes a wild growth. Like why why why? It only hits forests. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right all right what, what are the odds you have a forest after you've cast a triple green pip creature <laughs> yeah all right i, I realized that as soon oh, as i oh, said oh, it oh no i tapped my city of brass <laughs> into my firelit thicket into my twilight mire i don't know i could see jer like cheating this out with a black lotus and not having a forest in play yeah that could uh, yeah. happen <laughs> so like, yeah that is a thing i would do yeah <laughs> all right next up we have realm walker three mana two three shapeshifter for two and a green as it enters the battlefield choose a creature type you may look at the top card of your library at any time you may cast creature spells of the chosen type from the top of your library hey jared guess what it's a druid you stole my line surge <laughs> sorry what do you think of this card oh. jared it's a druid. Hey, what interesting insight. Yes, this card, <laughs> this card goes in druids. Oh my god. More importantly, it, it goes in elves. You sound so sad talking about it now. I'm sorry <laughs> I took your line. It also goes in Jun Goblins, which I think is maybe the best home for it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm excited for this in Merfolk. I just saw this. I'm like, oh my god, it's a Merfolk. You could borrow these zombies with this card too. A uh, green is yeah. like the last color I would play in zombies, but I don't know. Pretty much. This is just really good. It's yeah, yeah it's just a really good card. It's a druid too, which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding, Wheeler. Really? Surprised chair missed that. Yeah, I mean that's a little weird, but <laughs> All right, I'm so sorry, Chair. Moving on, uh, we got Roots of Wisdom, two mana sorcery for one and a green. Mill three cards, then return a land card or an elf card from your graveyard to your hand. If you can't, draw a card, Wheeler. So, as per the prophesized elf dredge, that's a deck that wants to play a bunch of cards that just mill cards. And I think that this is probably a pretty reasonable card to play in that deck. Grapple with the past is already something that you are wanting to play. Like those, the, the dredge decks of all shapes and sizes have kind of moved away from like jamming every single mulch and whatnot because Bizarre Baghdad fills your graveyard a little quicker. But grapple with the past, which is like a two mana mill three, then return a 
permanent, I believe, or a creature or a land, maybe, from your graveyard to your hand. Creature or land, yeah, is is great. Like, that one has stood the test of time. That one's an instant, but usually you're doing that on your main phase. And Roots of Wisdom kind of just does exactly that. Like, you get to mill three, and then you're either returning Gaius Cradle or any elf, I guess, which is nice. And if you can't, then you get to draw a card and then replace that draw step with Golgari Grave Troll. But usually you will be able to do that. The only downside is this card doesn't hit Wirewood Symbiote, which is like pretty integral for that deck. But yeah. I, I just wish it said you may. And if you don't draw a card, I wish it g- yeah. gave you the option to draw a card. But Right. That's that line for dredge that you don't have, right? Because yeah. if you have a dredge target in there, you can't choose not to take it to dredge. Yeah, but usually if you are returning in, uh, at the very least, an elf, you're probably going to find a way to turn that into cards to then mm. replace it. But yeah, still, it just it feels kind of weird that you're forced into that. Next up, Snakeskin Veil, single green pip instant. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. It gains hexproof until end of turn. Wheeler. Uh, this card's great. A Blossoming Defense is a good magic card. I, I basically have had the question asked, is this better than Blossoming Defense? Like every daily since this card got previewed. And I don't think that matters. Like it does what Blossoming Defense often is looking to accomplish. It has, it slightly shifts part of it, right? Like you get permanent 1-1 one, one instead of immediate plus 2 plus 2. But I'm just going to always play this card alongside Blossoming Defense. Like it just... Yeah, I just play both, right? The better question is, is it better than Ranger Skyle? And the answer is yes. <laughs> I was just going to say that like the whole just play both, kind of like, eh, Ranger Skyle no good art but no but this one is just like oh yeah oh i'm very much here for it yeah and the art's good oh yeah (laughs) also very good all right let's talk i mean we've been talking a lot about elves let's talk about this surprisingly ripped elf planeswalker tivar kel four mana planeswalker with three loyalty for two green green has a static ability elves you control can tap to add black mana plus one ability put a plus one plus one counter on up to one target elf has to be an elf untap it it gains death touch until end of turn zero ability you get a one one green elf warrior creature token and minus six you get an emblem with whenever you cast an elf spell it gains haste until end of turn and you draw two cards what do you think team I love that that's its ultimate. It's like, it's not even you in the game. It's you get to have fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and your opponent probably has to concede. Some of the most fun that I've had with call time so far was just, I drafted a deck with five of the one mana, one, two reach elves that you can tap another elf to add a mana. I drafted five of them and had this guy. I just got to ultimate and was like, Vroom! <laughs> just playing out these stupid one twos. And it was, yeah. And to think you get to do that, that you know not every game because they might just die from getting to activate its plus one like once or twice depending on how many rafelloses you have in play yeah or like like you even just devoted druid feels like cheating right <laughs> like you're just like oh i get two free untaps okay cool oh, yeah that's pretty good yeah I don't... <laughs> yeah this card's good what do, you, what do you mean surprisingly ripped look at the number of muscles where the rib cage. Look should at be. the number of elves in this set that are warriors and not druids, and then tell me it's surprising. Look at that WWE championship belt he's wearing. <laughs> My God. <laughs> all right, that's that's fair. I didn't realize he was also the champ, so it all makes sense now. All right, and let's talk about our last green card of the day. It's your boy Vorinclex Monstrous Raider. This is a six mana, six, six legendary Phyrexian Praetor for four green green has trample and haste and reads. If you would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, put twice that many of each of those kinds of counters on that permanent or player instead. And then if an opponent would put one or more counters on a permanent or player, they put half that many rounded down. What do we think, team? Quite good against the Planeswalkers. Yep. I think it's it's just it's just quite good. They made a mono green dragon. Yeah, it has haste. That's that's the keyword. Like if it just had trample, I don't know if this is playable, but because it has haste, it's it's quite good. It's yeah, gonna kill people dead. I'm looking forward to playing this in just like hoof. <laughs> like just just playing this in like a ah, I get to cast this on turn four. They're probably dead, you know? Like it's big. It does shut down certain things. It completely shuts off sagas. Yeah. They don't get yeah. to put any counters on them. It always yeah. rounds down to zero. 
Lots of planeswalkers can't ever ultimate. Except for yours, which can mostly <laughs> ultimate immediately. Yeah. Does it double one's counters yeah. that they enter with? Yep. <laughs> it's pretty pretty good with the four mana Garrick from Core 2021. <laughs> where you could huh. if if having Vorin clicks out wasn't enough, congratulations. You immediately get to ultimate. I see. Mm -hmm. So maybe a dumb question here, mm -hmm. but what decks are playing Vorn Clex in our format? Do I got Ancient Tomb? Is it just like medium and big green? Like, is this changing, say, Hoof? Is this now a new aggressive, like, mid-game finisher if you don't just Hoof them out because you I, cast it on turn three or something? You could play it in, in like, variants of Hoof that, like, try to have, have like, a mid-range creature game plan. Like, Hoof yeah. is sort of a deck that, like, 60% of it is core, and as long as you have the the, like mana elves and and hoof and some creature tutors in your deck you always have access to that game plan and the other like 30 ish cards you can sort of do whatever you want with like hoof as a deck has really gained enough diversity so that like the red green version which is kind of the old faithful is now just wildly different from the like blue green green or like the the bug version with a heavy elf package which has been one of my decks of choice over the past year i get oh god over the past year and like like they do enough different things and i, I think one of the things the red green deck does really well is that you just get to play like giant idiots that hit, <laughs> that hit. like yeah. summoners pack for this card or even just natural order for this card, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's yeah, that that hits like a truck berserker. Are you ever natural ordering for this over primeval titan? Uh, that's what I'm wondering because if you look at the hierarchy of six drops, right? You've got primeval titan as a really really strong card in your own deck. It gives you combo finish. It gives you just like a ton of ceiling space for you know. Okay, that's my six drop, but wait, there's more. If you're playing against control and you're worried about dying, you can always get, you know, Carnage Tyrant or something like that as a as a great finisher that also protects itself in your in a like a control heavy meta. Where does Vorn, Vorn clicks fit? Is it a new triangle if you're maybe in combo and you want to kill them faster? Yeah. I, I think the immediacy of the damage and like the and the reliability of just pushing that when you need it is pretty pretty high up and you get to do it without wasting like your actual hoof because if you have a hoof etb then that's also just six mana or sorry six power trampled just by itself but then you lose the i mean you just kind of moving after that turn it's a little like less exciting it, it's just nice to have redundancy in big idiots that hit like a truck right yeah. That you could also reliably cast. Like, you could cast this card on turn three. Yeah, that's kind of gross. That's an oof. All right, let's move on to gold cards. First up, we're going to talk about Agar, the Freezing Flame. It's a three mana, three, three legendary giant wizard for one, a blue, and a red. Whenever a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls is dealt excess damage. If a giant wizard or spell you control dealt damage to it this turn, draw a card. Jer. I love this card. Counterburn's like always been one of my like pet decks that I love playing, but don't play very often in tournaments because it's not very good. This card just goes sweet in that deck. Yeah, I, I really like the card. I don't think it's exceptionally good or or playable, but it's. Sweet. <laughs> I love I mean, the. I love this card. I'm never going to play it. No, no, I'm gonna play it. I'm just not gonna play it. I'm gonna <laughs> play it like not in a deck I intend to win tournaments with. Or you'll play it in like a blue moon deck and <laughs> you'll think they'll sure. think you're playing blood moon and you, you just have Agar the horrible. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Turn two, three mana. You're like, oh, you're going to blood moon, aren't you? You're like, no, even worse. Yeah. The freezing flame is here. Four mana combo. You, pl you play Agar and then flame slash and draw a card and you're like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got there. <laughs> Unbeatable blocks and a mana elf and you draw a card you idiot you blocked my frost titan <laughs> i get to draw a card oh your inferno titan okay never mind deck's great <laughs> right because all the titans are actually giants oh, aren't they oh they sure yeah are. Mm -hmm. oh wow the un the unthought of synergy there how can you lose god imagine if the first tournament <laughs> the first paper tournament when we when things go back and the and the winning deck is a uh, rug giants yeah you're like wait what yeah it uh, turns out giants are just good now yeah that's actually really funny <laughs> Edgar really pulled it together 
All right, next up we have Arnie Slays the Troll is a two mana saga for a red and a green. The first chapter, target creature you control fights up to one target creature you don't control. Second chapter, add a red mana. Then put two plus one plus one counters on up to one target creature you control. And the final chapter, you gain life equal to the greatest power amongst creatures you control. Wheeler, what do you think? Who who put all these words on this card? <laughs> this is such a weird card. <laughs> it's so like I'm I I'm very down for some fight cards. Like I maybe maybe it's all the gladiator, but like Domri's ambush from War that of the Spark so good. is very good. Like I mean, the, a part of the strength of that card is also just like hitting planeswalkers. Yeah. But like this, this card just does a lot and like it feels very unnecessary and weird, but like it also just kind of lines up with what these decks also just enjoy doing, like adding one red mana. You're like, why are you doing this? It's like, well, I guess this lets you bolt something before developing your haste threat, or it lets you use that red mana into playing well, your haste threat, meaning that you can hold up a green for blossoming defense or snakeskin veil. And then you just gain life and you're like, oh, okay, I guess uh, I'm winning this race now. Like, it's just, I think this card does enough in all the right spots. And like, honestly, most of the time you're like, oh, cool. I get to play a fight card and kill their thing. But like, it is a source. Well, it, it is a, it, it is an enchantment, right? It's at sorcery speed. So it's uh, it might be hard to find room for this card over other options. But like th this feels absurd when you get to play it and you get to the second chapter. You're only playing it for the first two. Like, I guess sometimes you're happy with the third, but you don't really care about the third because this is probably an aggressive deck, right? Yeah. I mean, the third is relevant just because like... A lot of when you're if you're racing, right? And if people if you're against another aggressive deck and you know, we have a lot of decks where they'll try to win the aggro matchup by like one of Gruul's strengths is that it can be technically faster than mono red because it plays pump spells or like if you're going for more mid-rangey stuff you can beat out other mid-range decks because you got giant dragons and so basically they're they're able cards like that you're able to subvert like expected damage output if that makes sense like yeah. when you're racing with people and you're like okay well i can like I, if I make this attack, I can survive an, an additional six damage. Yeah, it messes up the math, right? Yeah. And it's just like any little thing because, yeah, that's just icing on the cake. But it's it's relevant enough that it will probably come up if you're racing against someone for sure. All right, next up, we talk about Harald, King of the Skemfar. Three mana, three, two, legendary elf warrior for one, a black and a green, has menace. And when it enters the battlefield, look at the top five cards of your library. You may reveal an elf, warrior, or Tivar card from amongst them and put them into your hand. The rest go on the bottom of your library in a random order. Wheeler, keep talking about elves. Now, this is like an absurdly good militia bugler. In, in an elf deck, you're going to hit... <laughs> right like you're a deck with like typically 50 ish maybe even up to 55 kind of like creatures available and almost all of those are going to be elves and like in elves you play a lot of accelerants so you will get to play this card on turn three you mean turn two turn two that's what i meant that makes sense you play acceleration and then you hold off on playing this guy <laughs> i was like yeah <laughs> I mean, we got to make sure that the coast is clear for Harold. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's almost always going to hit when you play this card in a deck. It's got a good casting cost. It's got a relevant ability. And like any elf with a reasonable ETB, they okay by me. You're a deck that will play, again, you'll be able to rebuy this card in like a variety of ways. And it, it's the kind of card that makes it less painful when you poop out a bunch of forest folk that end up getting swept up in a fiery blaze with agar just laughing and pointing being like ha, oh, oh, you thought it was blood moon but yeah harold this card is great it, it does everything that the deck's looking to do right on hey finally a creature that isn't an elf let's talk about immerstrom predator four mana three three vampire dragon Costs a two, a black, and a red has flying. When it becomes tapped, exile up to one target card from a graveyard and put a plus one plus one counter on the predator. 
and sack another creature, gains indestructible until end of turn, and tap it. Jer, what do you think? This card's a pretty good threat. Useful graveyard removal. I wish it had haste, you know? Yeah, that's a big mood. That's a it's big like mood. Not not quite Falcon Wrath Aristocrat, but it's kind of close. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's probably still playable because the graveyard removal gives it some nice utility, but yeah. It's a growth threat, which is always fun too. It has such a feeling of inevitability. Yeah, wish it was an elf. <laughs> Get out of here. All right, we have another Planeswalker to talk about. Let's talk about Kaya the Inexorable. Five mana, five loyalty for three, a white and a black. Plus one ability, put a ghost form counter on up to one target non-token creature. It gains... When this creature dies or is put into exile, return it to its owner's hand and create a 1-1 white spirit creature token with flying. Minus 3 ability, exile target non-land permanent, and minus 7, you get an emblem with. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may cast a legendary spell from your hand, from your graveyard, or from among the cards you own in exile without paying its mana cost. Those are some abilities. Let's, uh, let's start with Jer, but everyone can weigh in on this one. I really like this card. It follows along my like preferred sort of like formatting of Planeswalkers. The plus one has has some utility and like get offers it some protection. It doesn't protect itself like on an empty board, but the minus three does that, so that's that's fine. And the ultimate doesn't win you the game, but it provides a lot of utility in the right deck. So you're not gonna slam this in every deck, but in the in the decks where it's good, it's gonna be quite good. So yeah, I, I think it's reasonable, but it's not gonna see tons of play. It's going to see play in the right decks. Is this a control card or a mid-range card? It's a mid-range card, I think. Like, if you're a non-blue tabo control deck, you can you can play it, and that's fine. Like, Exile, non-land permanent is definitely text you want in, in the tap-out style of decks because you need to be able to deal with, with everything, and that deals with just about everything. But, yeah, it, it's not quite powerful enough that you're going to want to tap out for it in a blue deck. Anything to add, Wheeler? I am never going to cast this card. <laughs> <laughs> and and not necessarily for the like whether or not I think it's good or actually oh, I mean, no I'm not going to cast this card who am I kidding not as a critique on its on its text I I just like that. this is very much not my kind of card outside of commander I'll lose to this card I'll think about playing this card because it's pretty good with like you know karmic guide revel arc cards I like. But no, that's it. All right. Next up, we have Cole, the Forge Master. Two mana, two, two, legendary dwarf warrior for red and a white. Whenever another non-token creature you control dies, if it was enchanted or equipped, return it to its owner's hand. Creature tokens you control that are enchanted or equipped get plus one, plus one. A lot to unpack here. I'm going to throw this one to myself. It's, it's really weird that one line of ability is for non-tokens and then the other is for tokens. I yeah. kind of wish... I kind of wish it just gave a boost to equipped creatures. This card non-bows with itself. I'm so confused. Yeah, a little bit, right? It's nice that it protects those cards. And I want to address something that I read in the comments from episode one about the enchanted or equipped things. Because I look at this and I immediately want to go to red-white equipment. And people say, but Serge, what about, you know, the enchantress decks that want to be playing bestow creatures? I don't think you're playing red in those decks. I don't think, I mean... You could play Naya, but... Like Sanctum Stompy? The, like... Yeah, Sanctum Stompy, I don't think is splashing red. And no. there's maybe some weirdness in, like, red-white feather, but I just don't think that deck is good enough to be playing any of those auras. I think you'd rather just be going in for fast colorless mana and be playing equipment before you do that. Uh, I mean, not to... Everybody hold on to the nearest, you know, solid table beside you i think you could probably play this with blue right like you sure. could probably play like the aura deck or the cheap equipment deck with blue because you get a lot of really like it's weird to say but blue has some of the best like combat oriented auras right like where now you get staggering insight curious obsession the new rune that gives flying yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. like and and that's kind of in theme with what you're looking to do but like yeah i think between this and the the bestow creature deck they're just two different two two different decks yeah looking at this by itself it does once again get close to that that dwarf density that i've been keeping my eye on it's very neat but again this non-bow is so weird why does this non-bow? It, it non-bows, Ben, in that it wants you to equip both creatures and non-creatures. 
No, I th- I mean, th- thank you. Yeah, that part I got. I, I just meant more like, like, why? <laughs> yeah, I don't get it either. Like, yeah, like, it's just such a weird design. Yeah, I look at this card and I just, I it, it makes it look worse. It might be playable. Yeah, like, it is just, like, another upside. But that upside makes, <laughs> does make it look like a worse card. I think I'd play this card if it didn't have the second line of text. <laughs> Which is weird, because it makes it better that it's there. But if it didn't, I'm like, oh, this card is great. It's a slam dunk. <laughs> like Tokens. You, f- you feel like you're not getting the full value out of right? it. Right? So, yeah. No matter what you equip, you're losing value. I mean, it's weird, but it's relatable. Like, I, <laughs> I, I get what you're saying, right? Like, you want to use the whole hog. Super funny. I don't know. Put it in your red-white token, or your red-white... <laughs> equipment decks tell me how it is i'll probably try it let's move on uh we've got another commander card we're going to talk about here that's lathril blade of the elves a four mana two three legendary elf noble for two black green also has menace which is pretty common for these uh green black elves whenever it deals combat damage to a player create that many one one green elf warrior creature tokens and then tap and tap 10 untapped elves you control (laughs) each opponent loses 10 life and you gain 10 (laughs) wheeler oh god that i i love stupid stuff like that because you because it'll happen right like bolus's citadel has that line of text and you think like oh i mean they're dead before this is relevant right it's like ah maybe or maybe you're just gonna tap this twice and kill them but the thing with bolus's citadel is that you're often playing a bunch of cards that don't do anything to like facilitate that ability whereas this one you're just playing you just need to play elves and elves can attack and elves can whittle your opponent's life total down and Elves also just tend to replicate really quickly and easily. And can they, there's a whole bunch of stuff that lets you untap them. And that's the, like, that's just the worst ability on that card. Like, I, it's a relevant ish ability, right? But it's very much the commander ability on this card. Oh, yeah. The each opponent, right? Yeah. Like, the floor, if this smashes, you get to make two tokens but as we saw with like canopy tactician and whatnot adding adding some extra power not not super difficult to do having menace is kind of nice it is vulnerable i will say that it's got three toughness it's a four mana legend but typically elves can kind of get away with like you kind of just get to cheat like you don't have to like you get to throw all the the rule book out because you just add absurd amounts of mana, you get to skip your curve most of the time. And there's really just like three mana points. There's like, it's one mana, it's three mana, and it's other. And so this is kind of in the other category. Like, I don't think I'm going to play this in every... Like, this isn't like a slam dunk, is what I'm saying. But I, I'm willing to give it a shot, because it has enough of an upside to, to play. It should just be a druid, though, or something. Why is it a noble? <laughs> there's no druids in this set. Wait, actually? Are there no druids in this set? I don't think so. That can't be right. Somebody's listening to this on YouTube, and they're like, furiously typing, what about changelings, Jer? <laughs> God. I, oh my god okay <laughs> changelings don't count changelings don't count all right if you can name if you know a, a non-changeling druid in Caldheim, let us know in the comments not counting the commander decks i'm sure there's canopy tactician right ben i, I swear to god <laughs> <laughs> It makes three mana. Why isn't it a druid? I don't know. I, I hate to correct you here. That, did you know that's an elf warrior? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that, that's what warriors are known for. Adding a bunch of mana. Oh my god. All right, let's move on to Narfi. Narf, Betrayer King. This is a legendary snow zombie wizard. 4-3 for three, a blue and a black. So five mana, 4-3 says other snow and zombie creatures you control get plus one plus one and then has an activated ability of snow 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 return it from the graveyard to the battlefield tapped wheeler what do you think i cannot wait to get this card stuck in my hand playing it in like a mono red deck (laughs) like uh, i i really like this card but that's mostly because it's a it's a card that comes back to from the graveyard to play for free or not for free 
you have to pay three mana, but it won't get countered and you can do it at instant speed and you just need three snow mana. And so like if you're playing a blue moon deck or, you know, you don't even have to have the moons. Let's say you're just playing a blue red deck and you have a bunch of basics. Maybe you got a moon or two, but not all of them. Like uh, you cast a faithless looting. You put this in the bin, pay three mana, get it back. Bada bing, bada boom. And I will definitely play this in a mono red deck, by the way, with like cathartic reunions and stuff. And oh, it'll feel great. Yeah, I don't know. This card's great. It's, it's free. You get to cheat it out. There's a lot of value yeah and it, boy is it annoying you gotta exile it basically or like pacify it you're only thinking this is a snow 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 creature you're ignoring the cmc in the top right corner right i mean in in zombies proper this card is still good because that's a deck where you can get away with playing snow duels and even if you are something beyond mono black you can get away with still playing some snow duels and you can get away with probably casting this as just like a top of the curve lord if you really want it to be but like yeah the biggest appeal for me is that you pass with a bunch of mana up and then you get to reanimate this uncounterable four three at the end of turn cool worst case assuming you have nothing better to do <laughs> yeah all right let's talk about another planeswalker let's talk about nico aris aris sure nico is an interestingly cost planeswalker x White, blue, blue, starts with three loyalty. When it enters the battlefield, create X shard tokens. And a shard token, if you're not familiar, is an enchantment, not a clue, an enchantment that says two and sack it, scry one, then draw a card. Plus one ability, up to one target creature you control. Can't be blocked this turn. Whenever this creature deals damage this turn, return it to its owner's hand. Minus one ability, deal two damage to target tapped creature. For each card you've drawn this turn, and minus one ability, create a shard token. Now, originally, I was like, Jared, tell me about this card. And I think you said, and I quote, this is a blue-white creature that I'm, Planeswalker, I'm never going to cast. <laughs> yes, that is what I said. Is that about right? Yeah, it is not, not for me. So, like, maybe this goes into Enchantress, but, like, if your opponent has tapped creatures in Enchantress, you're doing something wrong. And you're not attacking an Enchantress. I don't know. This is, what deck wants Nico? Y'all remember Gadwick, like the triple blue X wizard from Eldraine that draws some cards? Yeah, I love that card. Gadwick is sweet. Actually. Yeah, this is like Badwick. <laughs> this meme is being brought to you by the Wheeler Gang. I don't know this. This card is so underwhelming. I gotta tell you. Yeah, it's just not very good. Yeah, shards are so clunky. Yeah, yeah. I think it's okay for cards like this to be bad. Like it's okay for there to be ba bad planeswalkers. Yeah, yeah. It's just kind of like cool. I mean. It's a neat design. Everything's way too expensive. It's too vulnerable. And uh, did I already say expensive? Great. Yeah, that's it. Let's talk about Sarulf, Realm Eater. Three mana, three, three, legendary wolf for one, a black and a green. Whenever a permanent an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, put a plus one, plus one counter on Sarulf. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have one or more plus one plus one counters on it, you may remove them all. If you do, exile each other non-land permanent with convert a mana cost less than or equal to the number of counters removed this way. What do you think, Wheeler? Oh, it's such a good dog. <laughs> oh, he's a good dog. It's so good in multiple ways. Yeah. <laughs> Now I get to play an, another card that absolutely ruins Eggs' life. Oh, uh, you know what? <laughs> Woo! I guess that says something. That didn't even cross my mind. Really? The time, yeah, I, I've just been too distracted by how good of a dog it is. We can call it Sarulf Mox Eater, right? What? Because it eats Moxen, because you remove one counter and then it exiles all your opponent's Moxen. No? Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. No? no? Well, well, just like deck, mo Moxen aren't usually going to the graveyard. The reason why it ruins eggs is like they all go to the graveyard and then come back and then the dog eats oh, them. Oh, you're, think you're thinking the other way. Yeah, I'm going to feed I'm gonna feed this dog some eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going I'm to feed. Hey, dogs can eat eggshells. You just got to make sure that it's nice and you know rinsed beforehand. We're talking about some really uh, stupid stuff here, and I'm going to say we to you know spread the joy for that that's mostly because this card's like extremely good yeah yeah <laughs> like it's just yeah. it's in the right colors it's cheap it it gets bigger when your opponent plays magic it also just has a reasonable body to begin with like three mana three three that's fine yeah god like like this is the kind of like three mana three threes are are they're they're great like god forbid they play it off a noble hierarch 
you're getting hit for a bajillion on turn two or three. I'm really confused. It's just such a good dog. A good card. It's going to get so big in our format. It's going to get so big. Yeah, like cards like this are great as opposed to cards like, you know, Opposition Agent, which we talked about for Commander Legends, which is uh, <laughs> bad, where like this is not a card that necessarily like prevents and punishes your opponent for playing Magic, but it's a card that just gets better when your opponent plays Magic. Yeah, it's not going to ruin a game. There's 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 active counterplay like you can remove it. Yeah, this this reminds me very much like <laughs> reminds me a lot of Mana George. Yeah, you know, Mana Gorge or Hydra doesn't doesn't have trample, but it's one of those things where you're just like, ah, uh, it's it's only a three three. If I play this right, I'm probably not dying to it that quickly. Oh God, I'm taking eight two turns later. Why is this so big? And it and and then yeah, the the exile ability as well. The fact that it exiles and not destroys is so like I brought it up earlier with that one three. Mm-hmm. Rex age esque mm-hmm. creature, and it it just makes so much of a difference. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I this is this dog can come in and eat my eggs any day. I'll hold you to that, Ben. <laughs> no, I, yeah, that's fine. I I'm I'm very excited to play this dog. Are you excited to lose to it? Yeah, yeah. It's right. a good dog. Yeah. Let's move on to the last gold card we want to talk about today. This is a last minute inclusion by yours truly, Showdown of the Scalds. This is a four mana saga for two, a red and a white. First chapter, exile the top four cards of your library until the end of your next turn. You may play those cards. And then the second and third chapter abilities are the same thing. Whenever you cast a spell this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. I actually like this card a lot. I think this card is great. I was actually a little bit shocked when I noticed we almost didn't talk about this. Speaking of mana, George. I think this card does exactly what the red-white deck has been missing in our format because it's it's a deck that can very quickly run out of steam because it tries to dump its hand as quickly as possible. And if the opponent isn't dead, you're, you suddenly start sweating. So it gives you the ability to refill a bit once you're getting to the point that your hand might be empty. And it really helps finish with those when you cast a spell this turn, put up some, this one counter by pumping those creatures. If you give them double strike, you make it just a little bit stronger to finish the game. I think this is probably going to be pretty close to helping a red-white deck that has been struggling for a while get that much more competitive. I could see probably a bunch of decks playing this. I don't know. What do you two think? I really like that it lets you play lands. Mm -hmm. I feel feel like cards like this are, and this might speak to why it why we seemingly slept on it because like when i think of cards like escape to the wilds from eldraine where you look at it and you're like oh yeah i guess this could be pretty good but like eh, am i paying all this mana for it and like yeah escape to the wilds hasn't like popped off in our format entirely but that card is still just fine if not good and you know in certain formats a little broken so i think it's kind of difficult to evaluate just like the big draw spell factor of this card but yeah the fact that you can play lands that you're probably going to have some free spells or cheap spells like and it turns things into mana george hard to complain about that this card's uh this card's i could see myself losing to this card absolutely (laughs) yeah all right and to close out our set review let's move on to artifacts first one we're going to talk about today is a vehicle called the funeral longboat Two mana gets you a 3-3 vehicle with Vigilance that crews for one. I'm pretty happy to play this in, in most of my artifact decks. It's no looter scooter, but it comes down at the right turn. It crews for the right cost. And, you know, turning a one power into a 3-3 three, three seems all right to me. Vigilance is disgusting. I'm not sold on this card. Oh. I, ju- I just think it being a ground creature means you're like... It's going to get outclassed a lot sooner than Looter Scooter. Like part of the advantage of Looter Scooter is it's really good on clogged boards and that it both lets you like recycle bad cards in your hand and still chip in, chip in damage. And I think like early on when you foresee yourself playing this is when your bad creatures get to attack anyways. So I think you're you're more likely to be actively trading off damage. Whereas like in the late game, this this likely isn't going to get to attack. Interesting. I don't know. Jer, Jer. You're, you, do you get what you're doing? Serge was about to play a two mana artifact. What do you think he's cutting for this? <laughs> this was our chance. <laughs> I thought he already cut Hovermeer. What do you think Hovermeer is piloting with its one power oh, wheeler? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> no. Please. I mean, at least Hovermeer can ship in. And, like, yeah. 
no. <laughs> All right. And the final card that we're going to talk about in our Kaldheim set review is the Pyre of Heroes. Two mana artifact, two and tap and sack a creature. Search your library for a creature card that shares a creature type with a sacrifice creature and has converted mana cost equal to one plus that creature's CMC. Put that creature card onto the battlefield, then shuffle. Activate this ability only as you would a sorcery. Jer, take us home. It's a druid. It's also an elf and a and a goblin and a and a merfolk. Yeah, this card's really good for for tribal decks. It lets you tutor up lords really easily from bad creatures that inevitably make their way into tribal decks. It lets you tutor up like your sort of like unique silver bullet type cards that also inevitably find their way into tribal decks. It's very cheap. It's easy to cast. It's relatively easy to activate. It's very, very good. You you missed you missed the most important creature type though. What? Human. Do you know how many just randomly broken cards are human? Yeah, I, I know. I've lost to them plenty. They're just so boring. Oh well, he, if you think that's boring, wait till you hear about the various mages I'm about to talk about. I'm going to play this card in artifact combo decks because this lets you go through a variety of trinket mages. Oh dear. Up, up into pick your poison. You can get up to Urza. That's a pretty good magic card. Uh, you can get up to Oriox Salvagers off of your Trinket Mage. That's a pretty good magic card. Are they both artificers or are they humans? They're both humans. <laughs> They're both humans. There's some cons. This sounds so stupid to say aloud. There are construct lines that let you get up to Scrap Trawler, which is pretty reasonable. And then this is just a two-man artifact that is tutorable. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. I hate it. Oh, my God. Hey, no worries. Also, yeah, this, this card is sick in, in goblins. Yeah, wow. So this is the end of our set review. And I wonder any closing thoughts you have on, on Kaldheim. I like this set a lot more than the last ones. Oh, thank God. Yeah. I, fe I feel like the last ones, we were just like, great, more of the same. It's going to be so much fun playing against Opposition Agent and, and, and. But yeah, these cards are mostly cool. <laughs> they are still good, but like good in a more reasonable way. It, it's really nice to not get at the end of a set review and be like, oh, well, oh, this is going to make me, uh, you know, not have to think that it will actively make me hate magic or dislike playing, <laughs> like dislike playing, you know, like I don't have to worry. I guess yeah, I still have to worry about opposition agent, <laughs> but like I'm more excited to play magic than before this set. Whereas like previously, yeah. I, I may have been slightly less excited to play magic than before that set came out. This one is just fun. Yeah, it's sweet. The flavor is mm -hmm. spot on. The cards are really cool. Yeah. Right. Ah, uh, good snow joke. Good snow joke, Wheeler. Nope. What? No. <laughs> and I don't mean cool in the like thing you say about a bad card, but the cool in the sense of like a lot of them have unique abilities, right? Yeah. Like double your treasures, your damn, all your spells have trample. This card says the word giant wizard on it. <laughs> like there's a lot of unique flavor attached to them and they're all powerful enough to probably kick it in the format, but not so overbearing that you're like, oh my God, am I literally like, am I going to start playing? Like what, like, what do I do if my opponent has three mana open? <laughs> nothing. I'm terrified. Yeah. You can literally do nothing. Yeah. Guess I'm playing Galvanic Blast and Eggs. Here we go. <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts? Uh, <laughs> it's okay to have no final thoughts. That was a good conclusion. Mm -hmm. Just think about Yorn, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, why did you bring that image back into my head? Oh, we were, we were ending on such a high note, Wheeler. Way to go. We were just like, oh, yeah, this set is so cool. The flavor's so good. And now on about man spreading. <laughs> it's just so unnecessary. <laughs> That's gratuitous, I think, is a good word to have there. Oh, yeah. Very key word right there. All right. Well, let's bring it down a little bit with some more real talks. A reminder that after this episode, if there's a little bit less North 100, that shouldn't come as a surprise to you due to the continuation of the COVID-19 pandemic and our inability to play Magic. We are going to be recording less. We found that when we're not playing as much, we're just not as excited to talk about the format. At the very least, you can still expect set reviews going forward because those are actually a lot of fun to talk about. But uh, if there's not as many episodes, don't panic. This is to be expected and uh, look forward to more episodes once the world starts to reopen. 
Thank you so much for listening to our three-part set review. A reminder, if there's any cards that we missed that you think we should talk about, let us know in the comments down below. I've been Serge. Thank you very much to Jer and Wheeler for joining me. Reminder that this podcast is brought to you by you, the support of the Patreon over at patreon.com slash loadingreadyrun. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye.